Hi there, welcome to That Board Game Show. My name is James Wood, and today I'm going to show you Ancient Terrible Things Reawakened. Designed by Simon McGregor, with art by Rob Fansill, and published by Pleasant Company Games. A 1 to 4 player game of adventure and exploration. The history of that doomed expedition is shrouded in whispered rumour. A group of adventurers set out by riverboat, deep into a remote jungle, in foolish pursuit of fortune and glory. The battered journal of the lone survivor, said to contain fantastical scribblings of ancient secrets and terrible things reawakened, was soon consigned to the sanatorium furnace. Today I'm going to focus on showing you the solo adventure, which is called Forgotten Secrets. It's going to give a pretty good sense of how the multiplayer game plays as well, as what I'll be doing on my turns is the same as what I would be doing with multiple players, and I'll explain the slight differences as I encounter them. I should add that everything you see here today is in prototype form, and is subject to possible change. In Ancient Terrible Things Reawakened, the players assume the roles of brave, or possibly foolish, adventurers who are setting out into this deep, dark jungle to find secrets and mysteries that they've heard rumours of. What we're going to be doing as the game progresses is rolling these dice over here and trying to get certain dice combinations to match the encounters out on the board here. So we need things like five dice of three or more, or a pair of fours or higher, or a single six, and basically you're looking for runs, pairs, three of a kind, that kind of thing. And you're trying to collect those dice to go out and discover these encounters and add them to your collection of secrets that you have learned. At the end of the game, the player with the most secrets will win. Today I'll be showing you how the game plays by showing you the solo mode, which is called Forgotten Secrets and it pits me, the solo player, up against this adversary over here, a secretive shadow organization that's gone out ahead of me into the jungle and they're looking for these secrets as well. So I'm trying to discover more secrets than they do. If I manage to get through this entire encounter deck before time runs out, or I go mad, that will be explained later, then I win. That's the general overview. Let's dive straight in and show you how it plays. You'll see these cards off to the side here. These are for the other players. If I were playing a multiplayer game, you have different character cards. The Wily Prospector, the Errant Eris, the Dogged Reporter, and today I will be playing as the Stoic Captain. And you'll see they each have a different starting resource bonus and a little bit of backstory. So let's see what the Stoic Captain says. That relic doesn't exist, and you better forget you ever saw it. Understand? Hmm. Okay, so he's been down this river a few times. So we take that card. Each player would pick one. We slap it face down on our lovely dual layer player board here. And it will show us a hat. Now each player also has the same power. The artwork is just different for each one, but the function is identical. So I'll set those aside for now. And we each get a certain amount of starting resources a MacGuffin card, and three feet cards. So these feet cards are things that will allow us to manipulate the dice and do special actions and so on throughout the game. So the first thing we do is reveal, which I skip at the beginning of the game because we already have encounters on each location. Then we proceed to step two, explore. Move to a fateful location, take the leader action, then each player takes their location action. So each of these spaces here is called a fateful location. We have the accursed shrine, the sinister chateau, the yawning chasm, the rusted gun sloop, and the trading post. And each of these tiles is also double-sided and some of them have different locations on the back for variations and more ways to play the game. So the first thing I'm going to do is move to a fateful location. I take my adventurer token, 
and I place him somewhere on the board. So let's pick a location and then I'll explain what it does and why I chose to go there. Okay, I'm going to start out by going to the trading post and at the trading post, the first thing we do is collect any tokens on the board there. Then we go from left to right here. So the leader, whoever went to this location, gets this bonus here. In this case, it is to take this monkey tile, flip it to its active side, which will allow me to buy one of these swag cards later on. I then refresh this if I want. So I'm going to discard one of these. I'll discard this transport because it's gonna cost four money and I only have two to start the game and replenish a new one. And then I may buy a single swag card from the trading post. And these cards are gonna help me throughout the game. So for now, I'm gonna pay two money over here, one, two, and I'm going to buy this blade. This blade will allow me to lock any one die later on. And that will become apparent as to why that's useful momentarily. We replenish that. And then we proceed to step three, which is encounter. We will build our dice pool, roll your dice, then perform feats and use swag. So we first build our dice pool. We collect all of the green dice by default. All of the green dice and these two white action dice. Then I may look at my feet cards over here and any swag cards I have that would manipulate my dice pool. Like for instance, this Tinker Taylor card says swap a green die in your dice pool for a yellow die. Whenever you roll any green dice, you may re-roll any yellow dice for free. Again, that will become apparent later how it's useful. Right now, I can't afford that card because I only have one feet token. This talisman does a similar thing. It's a swag card, which you can use to swap out a green die for a blue die. But I won't go into explaining how that works right now because I can't afford it yet. So right now, I can't manipulate my dice pool. So I'll take my five green dice and two white dice and I will roll them in this fantastic dice tower. This has to be one of the most elaborate dice towers I've ever seen in a game. And this is an optional expansion that will be released separately to the game itself, which is also compatible with the first edition of Ancient Terrible Things. And you'll be able to get this dice tower on its own for use with that game if you already have a copy. So with that said, let's roll the dice into this riverboat dice tower and see what we get. We are looking for a single six. That's all we need for this haunted ancestor encounter. We just have to get a single six. We did not roll a single six. In this game, you roll the dice once and then you're stuck with what you've rolled. Then you have to use swag and feet cards to manipulate those dice or potentially reroll certain dice from the pool. The first thing we do after rolling the dice is take these two white action dice and lock them onto our player board over here with this little locked dice area because those are immediately locked, which means they cannot be rerolled or manipulated in any way. After rolling the dice, we can now perform feats and use swag. So now I'll show you how these swag cards work. And in this case, I need a single six and I haven't rolled a single six. So I'm gonna take a white action die and I'm going to place it over here on this hat. You'll notice that some of them have a little arrow to the side here, which means you have to exhaust that card to use it. Other times, like your hat, which has its own slot on your player board here, does not exhaust, but you can only use it once per turn because you can only activate it with a single white die. So the hat will let you spend any number of focus tokens to lock that number of green dice. Then reroll all remaining. So I could spend a focus token here to lock any one of these dice. But right now, that's not actually gonna help me because I need a six. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the hat, but I'm not gonna spend any tokens and I'm just going to reroll all the dice. So let's see what we can get here. And there is my six, fantastic. So now I've got the six I need. So I can stop rolling at this point. I don't need to do any further rolls. The six will allow me to defeat this haunted ancestor encounter here. I managed to steal myself and survive the encounter. 
And now I can look at the remaining dice that I didn't use to defeat the encounter. And any dice left over, you check this little handy dandy chart over here, which is also on the dice tower. And it tells you which tokens you get for any dice left over. So a single high die, a die of four or more, will give me a focus token. A pair of three or greater will get me two feet tokens. Three of a kind, of any number, will get me three courage tokens. And a run of three or more will get me three treasure tokens. So in this case, I've got a pair of twos, which are not three or greater, so that doesn't help for that, and a single five and a single three. So the only thing those dice are gonna get me right now is a single focus token with that five, and then any white dice with symbols showing that you did not use, so in this case, this one over here, will give me one treasure token. And you'll see that there are different symbols on these two action dice, so that's a focus token, and that's a courage, and then four blank faces. This one has a treasure, and a feat, and four blank faces. So you're most likely to roll blanks with these, which is why you use them for your swag cards over here. So that is the end of the encounter phase. I now move on to the resolve phase, spend dice to gain resources, which I just did. With that five, I got a token. Overcome the encounter, which I have done with my six over here. So I, now I take this encounter and I tuck it under my dual layer player board until it stops over there. And I will collect these different encounter types as I go. So this is helping you see what types of encounters you've overcome, which is relevant for certain scoring opportunities like these prowess cards over here. And it also hides your secret value, the amount of secrets you've discovered from the other players at the table. Now in the solo player game, naturally that doesn't really matter, but it is still helpful to just keep your cards all neatly organized here and the little symbols visible. So my turn is done. I will take all of the dice, put them in the middle of the board over here on the river, and now play would proceed to the next player. In the solo game, instead of it going to the next player, we roll this black die, which will indicate where the adversary is going to go. So at the moment they're here, blocking off the accursed shrine location, meaning I cannot go there. So now we're gonna roll this die and we're gonna see where they move to. And they're going to move counterclockwise to the next location that has an encounter, which will be this one. And that is all they do. So that just simulates another player blocking off locations. And then I will go again, explore, encounter, and resolve. And I'll keep doing that until all of these encounters are off the board. Okay, so let's explore again. I shall move to a fateful location. I'm going to come over to this rusty gun sloop over here, pick up the token that was placed there when we set up. You'll see it matches the token of the encounter type that is there. Then the leader bonus for this place is to discard any number of feet cards you have. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to discard these two because they both cost two feet tokens and I only have one. And as you can see, there's none on the board for me to go collect. So I'm going to discard those into the feet discard pile over here and now draw back up to three, which is your starting hand. So we'll draw two cards and hopefully, there we go, I got some ones, so now I have cards that I can more realistically use. And where I'm playing with multiple players, everyone at the table would be able to do this draw back up to three action. So that's quite a good way that this game keeps all the players engaged. So you'll see on each location there's these two sides. There's the left hand action with this little icon showing that's the leader bonus, so the action that the player who actually went there gets to do. And then on the right hand side here you've got this little symbol showing multiple players, so everybody at the table gets to do that action. We move now to encounter, so build the dice pool, roll your dice, perform feats. Again, I have no way to manipulate my dice pool, so I will just roll all of these ones. You'll see that there's these different colors off to the side here, and those will come into play with these different swag and feat cards. For now, I'm not getting the cards that allow me to get those, so I can't show you how those work just yet. So let's roll these, and I'm looking for 
three of a kind. And would you look at that, I rolled three of a kind right out the gate. Okay, so these two action dice are automatically locked. What I can do though, is before we resolve this encounter, I can perform feats and use swag. So I'm going to lock these two action dice over here. I'm going to use this monkey tile, which can be used at any time on your turn during the game, to buy any one swag card over here. So I'm going to flip that over to its inactive side. And the only way to reactivate that is to come back here to the trading post in a future turn. Then I'm going to spend one treasure token and I'm going to buy this charm over here, which is going to prove very useful right now. I'll refresh that over there. Now I can use one of my action dice. I can exhaust this charm and this will let me gain one token of any type. So I will gain another feat token over here, giving me more options to use these in future turns. Okay, then I think that's all. I don't need to do anything further because I rolled exactly what I needed right out the gate. So I've got three of a kind, that's three fours. So as you can see, I don't need three twos exactly. I just need twos or higher and three of a kind. And then I've got two high dice, which will give me two focus tokens because they are different numbers. So we get two focus tokens over here. We overcome this sunken effigy encounter. We steal ourselves against that one as well. Slip it into our little collection over there and proceed to the next turn. We've used up all of our dice. We put these back on the river over here. That blank doesn't do anything for us. We will roll the adversary die and see where they move to. They go counterclockwise one space. So they'll go around the board this way and over there. So they are blocking off the yawning chasm. And it is my turn again. I am going to try a slightly harder location because I want to see if I can fail something and show you how that works. Uh, no point in the real game would you voluntarily go somewhere where, where you think you might fail, but let's see what happens. The Sinister Chateau gives me this treasure token thanks to the monstrous monoliths over there. I find some treasure scattered around on the ground there. Then the leader bonus is to declare a focus, a treasure or a feat token. So I can decide which one I want. I think I want some more feet because these are useful things to have to be able to use your feet cards. So I jumped the gun there a little bit. Technically how this works is you declare the token type, then everyone at the table gets a token of that type. So in this case, everyone at the table where I'm playing with multiple players would get one feet token. And then you see this little icon here matches these cards over here. We will compare our prowess in the different types of encounters we've overcome. So we have horror prowess, pitfall prowess, artifact prowess, and villain prowess. So these are different types of cards we are encountering. We're encountering treasures, you know, mystical artifacts and treasures and things. We are encountering horrific, terrifying encounters of beasts and creatures and mysteries beyond human understanding. There are villain prowess. So there are villain cards which haven't yet come out. And then pitfall prowess. These are like traps and hazards in the jungle. Everyone at the table sees how many of each type they have. And whoever has the most of each type will gain the prowess card of that type. In this case, I need to have at least two of any of them and I only have one of each. So now's not a fantastic time to be here, but oh well. So now next step is build the dice pool. Again, I have nothing that will allow me to manipulate it. So we will roll the dice. And we are looking for five dice of three or more. So right away, we've got three dice of three or more. And we'll pop that over there. So now I have a decision to make. Do I want to lock any dice? Do I want to try re-roll any dice? I can use my feats. So I can use a sublime move or a master stroke to set any one die to five or six. I could use both of those and just immediately conquer this. I don't want to use up my feet tokens. So I'm going to spend an action die on my MacGuffin card over here. 
and that will let me spend any number of focus to reroll that number of green dice. So exhaust that like so. I will spend two focus tokens and I will reroll this one and two because I'm looking for high values. There's a six. So now I just need one more. Hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to use this. I'm going to spend a feet token and I'm going to use my sublime move to convert any one die to five. Discard that. Turn this one into a five. And now I have five dice of three or more. And you'll see that because they're all separate, that's why they can be different numbers. So you see I've got three sixes and two fives. If I had a three, four, five, six, for instance, that would be fine as well. They just need to all be higher than three. When they're stuck together like this, so when they show the dice fused right next to each other, then it has to be the same value. So in this case, it has to be two fours, two fives, or two sixes. I don't have any dice left over to gain any tokens because I used up all five hunting for these monstrous monoliths. So we tuck those in there. And now would be a much better time for me to have come here because I've got two artifacts. So my artifact prowess would give me two extra points. But oh well, all the dice go back to the middle and play proceeds. So as you can see, our encounter locations are getting rather limited. So let's see where the adversary goes. They will stay where they are. So if you roll a blank face like that, they simply don't move. They just continue blocking off that location. So that leaves me with precisely one choice. I have to come here to the Accursed Shrine. So the first thing we do is the leader bonus for this location is to take this reanimation token and flip it to its active side. And that will allow us to refresh one of our swag cards at any time on a future turn. Right now though, we won't be needing to use that because the next step at the shrine is for everyone at the table to refresh three of their swag cards. So we can untap that, untap that, and those are ready to be used again. First thing I was meant to do is take that treasure token. And now I must assemble my dice pool, roll the dice. I can't add or remove any dice. So we'll roll the dice and see what we get. We're looking for two fours or greater and we do not get them. So what I'm going to do now is before I spend tokens and things trying to re-roll these and get a pair of fours, I'm rather going to just fail just to demonstrate to you how it works when you fail to get the dice you need for an encounter. I'm going to go to spend dice to gain resources. So let's see, and or overcome the encounter. So I can't overcome the encounter. I can use three of a kind to get three courage tokens over here. One, two, three on my board there. Those twos do nothing for me. Then I failed to pick up the dark signet. So that there goes into the rumors discard pile. So I went hunting for that signet. I'd heard something about it and I failed to find it. So now it just gets consigned to the rumors section of the board. And whenever you fail to overcome an encounter, you take one of these tentacle tokens from the Tainted Tide over here, and you will see that these increase in their number as you go. So that is a way that the game end will be triggered. In the solo game, if I fail to overcome five encounters and I take this Tainted Tide, the game is instantly over and I lose. If in the multiplayer game, somebody takes the Tainted Tide, that triggers the end of the game, and everybody will then compare their secrets, and whoever has the most secrets will win. And any tentacle tiles you have can be spent, you flip them over, and you can use them for an urgent revelation. So a zero or one, so I've got a zero tentacle over here, allows you to gain one feet card. So why not just use that right away? Let's do that. I'll have an urgent revelation, flip that over and get a feet card from the supply over there. If it had two tentacles on it, you can either get a feet card or refresh one of your swag. And if it has three tentacles on it, you can gain a feet card and refresh a swag. And there's a whole pile of these tentacle tokens in the box. 
you only pull out a certain number depending on the player count. And in a multiplayer game, the number of tentacles counts as negative points against your secrets that you have collected throughout the game. In the solo game, that's just a timer to trigger the end of the game. So in the solo game, it's a bit more important to avoid failing to overcome encounters. Whereas in the multiplayer game, if you fail to overcome them, you're just accelerating the game end. So with all of that said, it is the final turn of the round. You will see that there is only one location now with an encounter available. So instead of rolling this adversary die, we simply remove the adversary from the remaining encounter. I'll pop them in the middle over there. And I will now go over here to the yawning chasm and we will perform that location's action. So we get a courage token. We then get another courage token, which is the leader bonus over there. And now in the solo game, we use this side of the tile, which allows us to spend courage tokens equal to the value of the topmost card in the rumors discard pile to remove that card from the game. Why do you want to do that? Well, at the end of the round, which we're about to get to, I will compare the number of secrets I have accumulated to the number of secrets in the rumors discard pile times two. So at the moment there's two secrets in the rumors discard pile. I will double that, that is four. I then have to forget secrets equal to four. If I can't, let's see here, I've got one, I've got plenty, I've got 11 currently. But let's say for instance, I'd not got those two cards and I only had that. And then there were four in the rumors discard pile. And I couldn't forget enough secrets to equal what's in the rumors discard pile. I fail and I lose the solo game immediately. On the other side of this tile over here, this is the multiplayer side. And this is denoted by these little icons in the bottom here. It tells you which side to use depending on player count. When you come to this location in the multiplayer game, everybody at the table gets to spend courage tokens to claim an encounter card somewhere on the board without having to roll dice for it. So where there's a multiplayer game right now, I could spend four courage tokens and just take that encounter. However, we are not playing the multiplayer game today. We are playing the solo game. So I will spend two courage to get rid of this card that I failed to overcome earlier and remove it from the game entirely, thus making there be no cards in the rumors discard pile, which means there is less chance of me having to forget any secrets at the end of the round. So with that all said and done, let's pop that over there. We'll pop these back in here. And we now roll dice for this encounter. So let's see, again, I have nothing that will let me manipulate my dice. So let's just roll them. And that is completely wonky. So let's roll it again. Okay, what are we looking for? Three, four, five. Mm, okay, so that could be three, four, five or four, five, six. These are immediately locked. Now in this instance, I do not want to fail that because that would then put four secrets in the rumors discard pile. And that would not be good. So let's see, I've got three and four. My best bet will be to use a combination of my blade to lock one die. So I can lock this four and any dice you lock, you bring over here. Then I will use my hat and I will spend a green focus token to lock a three and then I will reroll the rest. So spend any number of focus tokens to lock that number, then reroll all remaining. So let's reroll all the rest over here and fail to get a five. It looks like I might be losing this one. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Ish. Okay, I think my best bet then, my last chance is to use this MacGuffin to spend any number of focus and re-roll that number. So we'll take two focus tokens and re-roll this one and two. And there's a five. Phew, lucky break. You, 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 you. So sometimes the dice just don't roll in your favor and sometimes they just do. Okay. So we've got the three, four, five we need for that over there. So that is vanquished. 
tuck that in over here. Whoop. And we have a pair of threes, so that would be good for a feet token and nothing more. Pair of threes can't get me anything else. So that will get me two feet tokens. And that is the end of the round. So now at the end of the round, before continuing to the next one, I would compare my secrets to the secrets in the rumors discard pile, which fortunately is now zero. And we proceed to the next round. So let's set that up real quick. We go to the encounter deck, bring my adventurer back over here, put the dice back in the middle, and we will reveal new cards into the locations here. And you'll see that these cards have got orange backs. These cards now have red backs. And some of the cards from that first round have green backs. So the green ones are slightly easier, orange ones are harder, red ones are the hardest. And you set up the encounter deck at the beginning of the game with a different distribution of cards depending on the player count. We place tokens in each location to match the type of encounter there. So over here we've got focus, we've got feats over there for these villain encounters. Yo, lots of villain encounters for this round. And a focus token over there. Then, this is specific to the solo game, we roll any die and we place the adversary on one of the locations. On a one, they would show up in the sinister chateau. On a two, which is what we just rolled, they show up on the accursed shrine, so that's where they're gonna start. A three would put them at the yawning chasm. A four would put them at the rusted gun sloop. A five would put them at the trading post. And if you roll six, then you just pick any location to send them to because there's only five locations. So that is specific to the solo game. And then play proceeds into another round after which we'll deal out more cards. And after the third round, if I've still managed to keep my secrets count up higher than the adversary and not fail to overcome too many encounters, I will successfully uncover the truth buried in this jungle. Otherwise, I am vanished into the depths of the jungle and never heard from again. <laughs> so I think that gives you a pretty good sense of how the game plays. If you have any questions about the gameplay you've seen here, please drop them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. And with that, I'll say thank you ever so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the show.